ahead and get started. Um, my name is Edgar Sasueta. I don't see myself, but I, I'm, I know you can hear me. So we'll go with that. Uh, Edgar Sasueta, I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations here at AXA. We appreciate everybody uh, joining us this afternoon to try to get uh, a little bit more information on here on the, uh, what, what's become routine here as part of our uh, budget release days, whether it be the January budget or the May revise, trying to get up, uh, uh, get our members the most information we have. The caveat we will always give here, uh, especially on days when we've just seen the budget, uh, but we've only had it really for a couple of hours, is we're going to, the, the aim here is to not answer every single question that will be out there and you will undoubtedly stump us. Uh, but that's okay because it gives us material to then go back to the policymakers and try to get clarification. The goal today is to try to share as much information as we have. Um, we've been in briefings uh, with members of the governor's office, the Department of Finance. Uh, we've been part of other meetings since the since the budget was released this morning, and we know that that information is really not a lot of use if we keep it to ourselves. So we try to get on here as soon as possible and share whatever it is uh, that we have. And here at AXA, we have a great team, which I'll introduce in a second. Uh, but we also pride ourselves, and I say this every time, that we can't do this alone. And it's a very much a team effort, and we don't pretend to have all the answers. So we've invited uh, some, some friends, old friends, uh, to, to join us again today to help us not only with giving some context, but also with answering a lot of the questions when we get to the Q&A uh, part of the, of the program. Uh, Patty Herrera, Dr. Patty Herrera, from School Services in California, joined us, uh, expert on so many things, on Prop 98, on facilities, you name it. Patty has her fingerprint on, on what's, what's going on here with the state budget. I know she probably a familiar face to all of you who attend the school services uh, programming workshops. And, and I think for both organizations, they will have some offerings here in the couple of days, the school services with their workshops that they have uh, next week. And then our other guest, our old friend Ivan Carrillo, who we still invite back, even though he's not, he, he's still part of part, uh, Team AXA, just the broader Team AXA, uh, representing Capital Advisors here today, uh, has become a veteran of these uh, webinars and, and has very much a pulse on our members. Uh, and he will also be helping us out, answering some questions and giving some context. Uh, Capital Advisors also has a series of virtual uh, workshops where they go through uh, uh, the particulars of the budget. And, and if you go to their respective uh, websites, whether it be school services or capital advisors, you can find the information on how to access their programming. And then let me take a moment to, to brag and talk about my team here at AXA, who you know make all this possible on a day-to-day -day basis and help us try to get the information out to our members. Let me start with Josh Peterson, who you can't see his face, but he's making all, the, um, all this run behind the scenes here uh, from our from our IT department and is helping us facilitate this webinar. Christy Chamorian, uh, who is also off camera, but you can see her face. Any of you who join us for our variety of committees and councils, our webinars, our superintendents meetings, know Christy also makes uh, this train move on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're happy to have both of them on. And now our legislative advocate, uh, Diana Vu, who is on camera, who will help us answer some questions. One of our newest members of the team, Dorothy Johnson, who we're very excited to have on board, has already been helping us dissect many of these portions uh, of the budget. And last but not least, uh, we have Megan Baer, who you will hear from here in a couple of minutes, who's running point now on our budget advocacy, and will do the majority of the presenting and going through some large overview slides. So I'll have a couple of comments here in a second. Uh, before that, well, actually, let me let me say this just for context. Uh, it goes without saying that this budget you hear, it's it's almost easy to get overwhelmed with the numbers, right? And it's a positive budget. So let's start on that. We're really good, as I like to joke over and over, we're really good at finding the things that we're not happy with. And we'll find things and, and not just we'll find them, you're gonna help us find those because you folks are not shy. So you're gonna already start uh, identifying some of those issues that need more conversation, that need more advocacy. Uh, I know we're a broken record on this, but it's worth repeating that this is the first step in the annual budget process. This is the governor presenting his proposed budget. It has to go through the legislature. It's gonna go through a lot of conversations. 
Uh, one of the caveats that we will give over and over again uh, this year is that the governor is also giving a little bit of warning that we have to be mindful of what May may look like. Uh, there's a revision to the budget every May. And given what we're facing right now, what's dominating pretty much all of our lives, especially you folks in the field, is Omicron, right? Is this latest variant and how that has a bigger impact on the economy, on the stock market. I think we're only just seeing this. A lot of these projections, a lot of this budget was built before this latest wave. So with that said, uh, I think we will have to be conscious of what kind of revisions, what will look different especially on the revenue front come May. But with that said, uh, it is a positive budget. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. I know it's hard to be ecstatic about anything, especially in a year where things are so difficult. Uh, as we've been noting of the three years that have been disrupted by COVID in terms of our school system, I think there's general consensus that this is probably the tough, the toughest of the years, right? While on one end, we have school students in in-person in learning for the most part, uh, and that's something that we've been fighting for. It hasn't come without challenges. And we'll be talking about how this budget lays out in the context of those challenges. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping before I hand it over to some of our guests is please use the chat uh, to ask us questions. We'll be keeping an eye on, on the chat. There's a lot of us, so we'll kind of try to tag team and address a lot of those questions. Uh, after we, we hear some preliminary um, takeaways from our guests, Megan will go through a large, uh, through a high level summary, and then we'll use the balance of the time to try to answer as many questions as we can. The goal is to get out of here by 4.30, uh, to be mindful of your time. Uh, but this is just the beginning of the conversation for us as well. There'll be many avenues for us to continue this conversation, answering the questions, getting your input in the weeks to come. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to yield first to Patty Herrera, who will kind of give us some initial impressions from the school services perspective. Thanks for putting me on the spot, Edgar. <laughs> well, as Edgar said, you know, I mean, I think we can all celebrate the fact that we are in the midst of a crisis and yet our economy continues to perform well, which of course yields unprecedented revenues uh, for public education. And we're seeing that in the governor's budget. Um, my first impressions of, of the governor's budget, I mean, is on that positive note, but when we dig down into the details of his education investments. Um, sorry, Edgar, I, I think you're already like, yeah, starting to point out sort of the deficiencies in the governor's budget. But you know, I think I would have hoped, given that given that Proposition 98 is expected to be at 102 billion dollars uh, come July, I think we would have hoped that we would have seen a greater investment in LCFF than just the 5.33 cola, considering that inflation is at 6.8 percent as of November. Um, and uh, and so we we would have hoped that we would have seen that uh, come through in the in the governor's budget. Um, I I also can't help resist but recognize that consistent actually with his spending across the budget, um, it, and how he has uh, proposed to spend uh, funding, um, not just in Proposition ninety eight but um, um, over the last three budgets is his uh, reliance on one time investments versus ongoing investments. Uh, we see that um, as a theme. One of the things that I also recognize and to some extent appreciate um, is that uh, unlike the 21 Budget Act that had what it, I'm sure feels like to the field, a million new programs that they need to implement uh, in short order, um, the, the governor seems to understand that districts need a break and they, they really need to focus on uh, the programs that were were required of them uh, just six months ago and, and, and continues um, those investments. Um, so, you know, there is some one-time spending across the budget, the, uh, the largest of which I think is uh, um, transportation um, and, um, and early literacy. Um, issues to deal with early early literacy, which I think we can all appreciate. Um, but you know, I mean, I think it's a, a judgment about whether or not we use the the resources coming into Proposition ninety eight on in ongoing commitments uh, to further uh, uh, the investments in Propos I'm sorry, in the local control funding formula, or whether or not these one time programs and investments are the way that we need need to make those investments to improve student outcomes. Thanks, Patty, Yvonne. Initial impressions. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good to be with you all. 
um, Edgar and Patty, I think you both set the context very well. I think uh, just a few takeaways that I would add is in, in watching the, the multi-hour press conference that the governor had, there was very little conversation about K-12 education, about public education broadly. Um, and I think that's just a, 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 in response to the fact that one, we're in an election year. And so, so thinking about what speaks to the electorate, there was a large focus on pandemic relief, on climate change, wildfires, um, healthcare reform. So that was really notable. Like again, just the, the minimal uh, discussion on, on education. Um, and digging into the, to the summary that was put out, there, another thing that, that stood out was just that there's uh, significantly less uh, uh, Prop 98 funding than what we saw uh, estimated in the legislative analyst office uh, projections. So nearly six and a half billion dollars over the three year budget spend. Um, it, it, in, in terms of the, the, the revenue numbers that we're, we're seeing on the, the governor's side versus what the LAL put out. Um, so um, that stood out that in terms of the LCFF, again, I mean, I think we've all been beating this drum for, for years now, right? I've seen the LCFF base as being really important to put uh, uh, funding into. Um, but again, as, as Patty pointed out, all we see here in the LCFF is the COLA being funded. And that's, that, that's, that's required through statute. And so we see no additional investment in, in the LCFF. Um, independent study, uh, it's, it's gonna be really um, interesting to, to dig into the details once we see the language come out. Um, but one thing that, that I think we'll all just have to be part of the conversation is that whatever changes we see with respect to the independent study that's adopted through the budget process, that's impacting next school year. And so we continue to hear from the field just the urgency, right? That and 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 the real life, real time um, uh, uh, situations that that educators are trying to respond to um, with respect to the independent study. Um, so those are a few takeaways, but certainly just echo the comments that um, the devil's in the details with so much of this, or with all of this, right? And so we we, we await trailer bill language now to to really get a clear sense of what the the governor is, is attempting to do. Thanks, Yvonne and Patty. Uh, appreciate both of you helping set the context. Uh, so with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan, who's gonna uh, walk us through a few slides here to kind of give us a little bit more detail. I will point out um, that AXA will have uh, a follow-up summary that we'll post here shortly. By, in, by the end of the day, that kind of summarizes some of this. Uh, I'm sure somebody will ask for the slides. We will make those available as well. And it go again to kind of give a pitch to the materials coming out from school services and, and, and capital advisors. They will each have summaries as well from the respective organization. So Megan, thanks for joining us. Um, we're really happy. For those that don't know Megan, uh, she came to us recently from, uh, uh, from leadership in, in, in the Senate. Uh, she was one of the highest ranking uh, education staffers in the legislature. So we are very lucky and happy to have her on Team AXA and helping us with our broader advocacy. So Megan, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Edgar. Um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you all uh, joining us here at the end of what I'm sure is a really long day. Um, if I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, if we go to the Prop 98 one. So just to kick it off to kind of give um, some of like the big picture overview we're looking at $102 billion um, going towards the Prop 98 guarantee. Um, this is an 8.2 percent, uh, $8.2 billion in dollar increase over last year's enacted budget. So significant, although not as um, great as Yvonne mentioned, um, as what LAO uh, projected. <clears throat> this amounts to about $15,000 per pupil. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so the significant part of that um, going into LCFF is about $3.3 billion. It's a 5.33% COLA. Um, this is the highest COLA that we've seen since the Great Recession. It's pretty significant. Um, additionally, you know, there's various, as you all know, there's, uh, and I apologize for the sirens outside our window, um, there's uh, many programs outside of um, LCFF. Uh, there is a 5.3% COLA. We don't know the extent to all of the programs that are 
getting the COLA or not getting the COLA special education um, was called out by name, um, but we're going to have to await uh, for their language to see exactly if all the programs or if anything is left out. Next slide, please. Um, the next piece is um, the local reserve cap has been triggered. So um, there's a $3.1 billion payment into the Prop 98 rainy day fund. This is significantly over the 10% or the, the trigger. And so it's gonna um, uh, trigger a 10% cap on local school district reserves. That is going to go into effect in the following school year. So that'll be an issue that we're gonna, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. Next slide, please. Um, additionally, um, you know, the governor, one of his um, top lines was the COVID relief package that he is putting out. He's proposing $2.7 billion um, with $1.4 billion for emergency allocations. He's focused on increasing testing capacity, um, accelerating vaccination and booster efforts, and supporting frontline workers. Um, this includes the distribution of the antigen tests that some of our districts have received. I understand some have not yet received them, and, and we've been sharing that information with the governor's office as well. Megan, can I make a point here on the test since there's been so much conversation on the antigen test? So we've been working real closely with the governor's team on this. So uh, as folks may know, there was announcements made before the or concurrent with the with the holiday break about trying to send home antigen tests with the goal of getting kids tested before they went to school. As we know, depending on what part of the state, depending on what county you were in, they had mixed results, right? So on one end, the, the state is trying to increase that capacity here in the weeks to come. Uh, what they're calling out here is uh, additional allocation, uh, understanding that there still may be a need uh, for increased testing and capacity here in the, in the school year. And this is also one important thing to note that while we uh, talk about the budget as really for the next school year, this the 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 components as it relates COVID response, the governor, as he noted over the weekend, that they are really trying to expedite some of that funding and is is looking to do some emergency actions here in the coming weeks or month to try to get some of these resources out in the midst while we're still really grappling uh, with Omicron. So a lot on the school testing front, uh, obviously, that's uh, outside of the numbers. But I know that this is an area of focus and concern for a lot of our folks in the field. Thanks, Edgar. I appreciate that. Um, moving to the next uh, fun topic. Um, so to all of your advocacy, the governor does acknowledge the you know, very real enrollment and absenteeism issues that LEAs are facing across the state. Um, he is proposing to change the way that ADA is calculated. Um, moving to, you could either use current year, prior year, or an average of three prior years ADA. Um, you know, we think that this is a good, is a good thing. It might not be enough, but it's definitely a good sign that he's acknowledging um, the real problem that the field is facing. So thanks for telling all your stories to all your legislators. We appreciate it. Next slide, please. Okay, independent study. <clears throat> so the governor um, in his budget um, acknowledges that uh, there's likely gonna still be very much a demand from parents and families for independent study. Um, we're still lacking a lot of, a lot of detail, but um, he asserts that virtual education will still be an option. Um, he still wants to use independent study as the vehicle to offer virtual education. He adds some minor flexibilities. Um, I don't think that it's going to be enough to alleviate the concerns that we've been hearing from the field, um, but we'll certainly offer the, us the opportunity to go in there and advocate for um, additional flexibilities. Next slide, please. Um, so next up, um, one of the big programs from last year that the governor um, uh, announced. Um, he is continuing the implementation of Universal Transitional Kindergarten, allocating over $600 million for the first um, round of implementation. Um, so the first couple of months of um, uh, four-year-olds, and Diana, please jump in here. Um, what's the, the sure, month? Sure, absolutely. In? 
So it's um, the first round, which are children who are turning five between September 2nd through February 2nd, beginning with the 22-23 school year. Great, thanks. He also allocates another um, a chunk of funds to add an additional staff person um, to manage those ratios that we've all been talking about to um, staff an, an additional adult um, in each TK classroom, and that's about $383 million. Next slide, please. Um, another big program the governor created last year, um, continuing the implementation, um, he's allocating $3.4 billion um, for the Expanded Learning Opportunity Grant Program. Um, 937 million is gonna be one time to support infrastructure and also integrating arts and music, music programming. We don't have a lot of detail on what exactly that means yet. Um, we'll be asking for that and looking out for trailer bill. Um, he also um, is continuing the one-time reimbursement rate increases that were agreed upon um, in the last year's budget. I believe the increase um, takes the programs to about a little over $10 um, per, st per student per day. Next slide, please. Um, the governor makes a significant investment in special education, 500 million into the existing AB 602 formula. However, it comes with a catch. Um, in exchange for the increase, um, there are policy changes. So um, those include calculating the SELPA based funding level, um, or excuse me, the special education based funding at the LEA level rather than the SELPA level allocating the educationally related mental health services funding directly to LEAs. He also consult, proposes to consolidate the two um, extraordinary cost pools into a single pool. In addition to, um, he wants to create a special education addendum that will have to go with your LCAP. So some pretty significant changes there. Next slide, please. Okay, facilities and transportation. So um, the governor is proposing for more than 2 billion general fund dollars to fund modernization and new construction um, projects through our existing facilities program. Um, this marks the, um, the first time that we're aware of at least for general fund dollars to be used for this purpose. Typically it's bond dollars, um, but as you know, the bond failed uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, he also allocates the very last bit of Prop 51 funds, um, so that'll use up the rest of that, uh, that bond. Um, in addition, he, with one-time dollars, he is proposing to allocate those funds to school transportation programs with a particular focus on greening bus fleets. Um, proposing to give out grants of $500,000 for electric buses and charging equipment. Um, nutrition. <clears throat> so another big program the governor proposed last year is continuing the implementation again. There's a there's a theme here. Um, he is proposing 596 million to fund the universal school meal mandate that's going to go into effect this coming year. Um, he's also um, providing 450 million one time funds for um, kitchen infrastructure upgrade grants. Um, as well as um, smaller amounts for um, to support school breakfast and summer meal startup grants. Um, and finally, um, there are you know some slight supports for educator recruitment and retention. He is providing funds to continue to waive the teacher examination fees as well as um, credentialing fee waivers. Also, if you recall, um, last year. Uh, we got an extension um, from the 30-day uh, maximum that a substitute teacher could be in the classroom to 60 days. That was a one-year. Um, that was a one-year policy change. He's proposing to extend that for another year. And I think that might bring me to the end. Uh, thanks, Thank Megan. Appreciate you going through those high-level. Uh, components. Obviously, this is not intended to be comprehensive. There's a lot of other uh, specific details. You'll see some of that in the full summary, some of the summaries that you'll see from some of the other organizations that think are intent here is to kind of capture some of the bigger picture pieces. If there's questions relating to something we didn't talk about, feel free to throw it out. I'll, I'll make a couple comments. One, first on this last um, slide that Megan talked about, 
about some of the tools that they're trying to give, given some of the persistence issues facing everybody right now is the staffing issues, right? And so we're trying to think about this in the long term. I will say while the information's not out there, I'll go venture to say based on some conversations we've had uh, with administration and others about they are actively looking at what can be done in the short term, right? So if, if we're talking about this in the enacted budget, uh, they also understand that there's some acute issues right now because of the Omicron variant, because despite all of us are intent to stay open uh, for in-person learning, that in some communities, you're just struggling to find the bodies on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's something we're engaged in actively, and, uh, and I think we may see some, some action on some of those fronts in the days to come, so stay tuned on that piece. Uh, the other kind of big picture comment before I ask a couple of these specific questions is, as Megan talked about, one of the big themes here is, and, and Patty touched on this, is investing in some of the programs that had already been enacted, right? Uh, I caught a, 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 a quote or a piece, and the governor touched on this too in his press conference, is that effective implementation for ambitious uh, proposals, and, and I appreciate that they're acknowledging they're ambitious, because there, there's a lot out there. TK, universal meals, uh, expanded learning program. These are all ambitious programs. And the governor's office is noting that effective implementation is going to require consistent investment in some of these programs. And that's why we're seeing a second round of investment on those ends. Now, with that said, I'll acknowledge that there's varied opinions on some of the programs or, you know, or how we actually implement that regardless of money. And that's something we could get into because I know in some cases, uh, this is another piece that we have to talk about. One of the pieces that's a bit concerning that I saw in the summary is that they're noting that a lot of the federal state dollars that were already allocated to schools, quote unquote, hasn't been spent, right? And they, 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 that was kind of a underlying theme here that, yeah, we're getting you on this, but we know you still have a lot of resources at your disposal. And there's a lot of varied reasons why some of those the dollars have not all been expended, but that from a political standpoint, I think that's something we're all going to have to be prepared to account for in our conversations with legislators, with the broader community about here is the real fiscal reality of what our schools are facing. Uh, with that said, let me jump back into the chat. Patty, I'll, I'll put you on the spot since you're you know, you, you're good at, you're, you're prepared for this. Uh, there was a number of questions on ADA changes and how would that would relate to, I think you're seeing some of those questions. So I'll give you first chance to kind of touch on that and take that in whatever direction you wanna go based on the, on the questions you're seeing there. Sure, I mean, I, I know this is top of mind for all of our school districts, particularly as they plan for their next budgets or start opening up uh, their budget development process for this coming July. Um, to th So this is just gonna be conjecture. We'll know exactly what the governor means by the three-year uh, ADA um, and how we account for that given the hold harmless, uh, ADA hold harmless this year. And then the fact that we actually didn't collect ADA for apportionment purposes in fiscal year 2021. So to the, my, my best guess is this, um, we replaced 2021 ADA with 2019-20 ADA. And, um, and so I believe that mechanically the way that the three-year rolling average would work for 23, for 22, 23, I really can't wait till we get out of the 20s. I'm not sure if the 30s will get any better, but the 20s are really hard. Um, anyway, um, the way that I think it's gonna work is an LEA would have the option of, of choosing the higher ADA of current year, prior year, or that three year. And the three years for 22, 23 would be 2019-20 twice, and then 22-23. Um, and so uh, be, that's the way I think that it's gonna work. But again, when the trailer bill comes out, which you usually, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, usually we would anticipate getting the Department of Finance's trailer bill proposal in early February. We'll see mechanically how they uh, put that together. Thanks, Patty, for that. And we'll come back. I know there's some specific questions that relate to ADA, so we'll, we could touch on those in a second. I'm going to pivot for just one moment and actually touch on something that we didn't uh, explicitly put in the PowerPoint, but I think it's worth noting because it was part of the broader 
uh, conversation in the governor's press conference, and I think it's it's, it's top of mind is is what is the state doing or not doing as it relates uh, to pension obligations. I know this is something uh, that Yvonne has been touching on. I know Dorothy's been looking on the uh, looking at this from our perspective. So Yvonne, I'll start with you in terms of what what this proposal doing, or are they just is there anything new, or are they just talking about things that had already been proposed or done in in previous years? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to clarify because I think it was a little confusing in the in the governor's uh, press conference. So the 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 proposal is to put um, to further buy down or pay down the state's portion of the unfunded liabilities with respects to CalSTRS and CalPERS. The distinction being that there is no additional funding to buy down school employer um, pension liabilities, which means that there would be no extension. Uh, of, of school employer pension rate uh, relief uh, beyond the current fiscal year. Um, so there's a certain, this is gonna, so, so you all know that there has been pension relief put into place that has buy, um, bought down rates over the last several years. Um, this current year, it was just over 2% uh, a reduction that we saw in, in the rates with uh, at CalSTRS and CalPERS due to the buy down. Um, so CalPERS and CalSTRS rates will adjust accordingly. Um, so we've seen uh, projections from, from CalSTRS that will it'll, it'll go up to 19.1%. We've seen projections on, on CalPERS' end that'll be about 25.5%. These numbers will be finalized uh, much later in the spring, but, but certainly how we see uh, pension relief advocacy play out within the, the budget process will, 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 will um, be one of the variables. Um, we've, we've heard the legislature, key members of the legislature, they're already on record saying that this is an area that, that, that they want to prioritize. Um, additionally, AXA and a number of other education stakeholders have, have made this a prior, priority within their budget advocacy and already made that known. Um, so uh, this will certainly be top of, of a mind and top of agenda moving forward. But, but in short, no additional pension relief for schools proposed um, beyond this current school year. Thanks, Yvonne. Dorothy, I know this is an issue you're also digging into on our behalf. Anything to add to what Yvonne had to say there? Uh, just that, you know, for the governor's standpoint, it is a smart move. It's a strong return on investment to, to pay down those liabilities. But as Yvonne said, it really doesn't translate to a uh, much of a win for um, for our interests. Thank, thanks, Dorothy. Uh, I saw a couple of questions in the chat about facility specific uh, to TK. Um, Diana, maybe I'll let you kick off there, but I know Dorothy and Patty also, this is an issue that, that they're looking at. So what, what's in there or not in there as it relates to facilities for transitional care, kindergarten um, implementation? Um, so unfortunately, nothing as it relates to TK. <laughs> um, it's something though I think we're all gonna keep an eye out for and that we've been advocating and will continue to advocate for. Um, Dorothy or Patty, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, that, that uh, general fund dollars, as Megan noted, is um, pretty much unprecedented. Um, it breaks it down 1.3 billion for the 22-23 fiscal year and then another 925 million um, for the following fiscal year. But again, it's following um, the existing facilities program. It's not anything earmarked or um, augmenting for, for TK needs. Uh, Patty, going back to the ADA issue, and I know there's a couple questions there. First, uh, well, I'll let you touch on two of them to start. One, I, I think there was a question about charter schools, and there was some reference there in the summary about what may have, uh, made the process there. Can you, can you touch on how did this impact charter schools? Yeah, so um, again, I feel like I always have to caution this by saying we gotta wait till the trailer bill comes out and I don't mean to punt, but we really do have to wait to see um, how the trailer bill comes out. Um, in the governor's budget summary, he indicates that the, the flexibility around how we calculate ADA for purposes of apportionment are, are for school districts. He does intimate that he's willing to talk uh, um, and have discussions around applying a similar or maybe the same uh, um, ADA flexibilities to charter schools. So he's not yet committed to doing that. He's just open to having conversations about whether or not we need to apply the same flexibilities to charter schools. Somebody also asked the question about whether or not that ADA 
uh, policy shift would apply to county offices of education. That's the one where I'm like, mm, we got to look to see, we got to wait to see whether and what's in the trailer bill language on that. In that, the opening paragraph around this uh, policy proposal, he names county offices of education, and then he doesn't name county offices of education as a constituent or a benefactor of the new policy suggests to me that county offices of education would not benefit from this new policy shift with respect to ADA. But again, I do think that that's something that we have to really look at when the trailer bill comes out. And then just, I'm sorry, Edgar, on, on the facilities piece, um, Dorothy's absolutely right. We've never used uh, general fund money in this way to fund school construction projects that, um, that you know, would normally go through uh, the state bond program. Um, and, and I think one of the things I want to caution folks against, uh, the $2.225 billion appropriation over the next two years to fund the SFP projects is, when you look at the projects already in the pipeline that are sitting and awaiting for processing at the Office of Public School Construction, these dollars are already consumed just by those that are, those projects that are sitting and waiting for approval. Um, so, um, so I, I just just to I don't mean to uh, put you know rain on everybody's parade about that. It's certainly something to celebrate because those districts uh, who have submitted applications. Uh, to the state allocation board that are beyond the current bond authority will benefit from this uh, investment, absolutely. And we should celebrate that. But um, but I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the pipeline that's out there will already consume those dollars. Thanks, Patty. Uh, it, like we said, it's our job to, even when things look like good news, uh, to, to, to find the things that, that, that we have to caution folks against. So no, I think that's a good uh, a good reminder of how some of this may play out. Megan, I got I saw a question about the universal meal requirement and about waivers for small. Since you were, you know, part of some of these conversations last year when, you know, the, there was a lot of uh, notoriety around this, this uh, enactment of, 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 this, um, of this plan and it was gonna be rolled out over a course of years. Kind of maybe talk us through some of the considerations at the time, the impact on different types of districts, do you see, what do you see this as even politically viable in terms of how it may apply to smalls or folks that might be challenged by the requirement? Sure. Um, there certainly is a lot of smalls um, have this concern. Um, I know the Small School Districts Association has been beating this drum um, about the very unique and different challenges that smalls have to um, implement this requirement especially smalls that are not necessarily um, low income, like have a high proportion of low income students. We've been hearing a lot from them. So it is certainly a conversation that is happening. Um, in terms of whether the legislature is gonna be amenable, um, the legislature is pretty adamant that they wanted this requirement across the board. Um, they want universal meals for everybody, regardless of income. You know, we'll see now, I think, as we're engaging this year, when the price tag starts hitting for how much that actually is going to cost, um, if, if they might be open to more flexibilities. Um, but at least in the last year, um, they were not amenable to, uh, to exceptions. Thanks for that, Megan. Uh, shifting back to the Expanding Learning Opportunity Program, and I, I, think, I, I think I saw a question as it related to facilities and the, that there was some ambiguity from CDE about whether those dollars can be used uh, for facility purposes. Patty, I, I put you on the spot again. Uh, are you familiar with that or have we heard anything on that end? Yeah, I mean, I am familiar uh, with the question and I, I would say that I'm, I'm with the person who uh, asked the question of CDE and, and still has not heard back from the department to get clarification on that because we knew we know that those dollars are attached to the provision of nine hour um, days of service when you when you add on uh, on top of uh, the instructional minutes um, provided um, to a student so it seems that it's operational i think we can all argue that you know you have to house these programs in, in facilities which are in and of itself operational but it's not clear uh, from the statutory language if school districts can actually, uh, or LEAs can use those dollars for capital outlay purposes. So I wouldn't want to step in front of the Department of Education and try to uh, conjecture an answer on that. 
Thanks, Patty. Yvonne, Thanks. I think Oh, go Sorry, ahead. can I jump in real quick? Yeah, go for it. Diana. Thanks, Edgar. Um, in this budget proposal, too, um, the governor also um, is providing 937 million um, one time support for ELO, um, which he also says is infrastructure, um, specifically for arts and music programming. Um, we'll, we'll need to look at trailer bill language to see what that really looks like, but um, that's something I just want to throw out there to people that are going to, like, as Patty had said, it's it's possible. Thanks, Diana. Uh, Yvonne, you just responded to a question. I know there's still a little bit of confusion about the references to the three-year average and what years would be used there. Uh, do you want to just elaborate on your understanding of that piece? Yeah, there was a, a question uh, with that called out a statement and uh, that talked about um, um, an allocation made to county offices of education and, and, and what was meant by by this statement. Uh, it, it's my read of it that that I I, I, I would apply the, the COLA to, to LCFF as well as the ADA three-year rolling average is, that would bring you to that number. But to Patty's point, it, it's, it's unclear. Um, so we kind of have to wait to see, but, but that's my sense of, of what they meant by that statement. Thank you. Uh, Megan, I'll let you touch on this. It's, uh, we've gotten this, we've seen this question a couple of times. Community schools, it was such an emphasis, continues to be an emphasis. No new changes, no new investments on that end? No, there weren't any changes um, to community schools at this point. Now, when Trailer Bill comes out later, we might see some tweaks to the program. Um, my understanding is the money has not started flowing out yet. So I'm guessing that's why they haven't put given any um, uh, revenue enhancements. And I would also just add to another question in the chat. There were no um, adult education changes in the, um, the summary doc that was released either. And we're trying to get clarity if um, adult education uh, is going to receive the proposed COLA or not. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Yvonne, I'll, I'll try this one. I, based on what we've seen or what we've heard, adult ed, I know we've gotten this question a couple of times today. Do we know if there's any changes or augmentations to any adult ed programs based on the governor's proposal? No, uh, I'll, I'll poke fun at you because Megan just just touched on that. That no, we don't see any um, any adjustments to adult ed specifically called out. Um, so it may very well be the case that the the cola does apply, but it but we don't know that to be the case just just yet, and we won't know that until we see uh, trailer bill language. That's but we'll try and get some clarity and communicate it out. Yvonne calling me out for uh, reading and not listening to my team <laughs> while, they're, while they're talking. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that's one to, <laughs> that's not the one we want to reiterate. But I know the questions come up, so I appreciate that, Yvonne. Uh, how about CTE on that, in that same vein? You want Yvonne, since your face is on the camera? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, there, 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 there is a CTE augmentation called out um, to the CTIG program, um, specifically related to to ag, to agriculture, and so it is an, an ongoing increase of two million dollars. Um, that it's a really high level uh, uh, summary that we've seen, but two million dollar augmentation um, with uh, for CTIG for for ag, specifically for ag programs. Here's a good question, and I'll, I'll, I'll I think we'll give. A, a few of you kind of the chance to talk about this big picture more from a, a, a political standpoint that one of the themes here, and I think it's one of the challenges that we've had in terms of the narrative that while there's a lot of money, and there is, it's hard to discount that there's a lot of money, there's also a lot of proposals, and that's kind of been the theme, right? And most of these dollars are not free and clear uh, to, to be, invest in some of the obligations that, that districts have or the commitments that they already have. And one of the things we've been beating the drum for some time is about more money into the base, really investing in LCFF. Uh, so there's a question from Annette about, it seems that there's a lot of competing, you know, dollars within 98. Uh, you have the UTK and the extended learning opportunity. Uh, you know, how do, we, how do we make the case for, and is there potential opportunity for thinking about how to expand uh, or, or, or get more money into LCFF? Um, Patty, you noted this in your introductory comments. So I'll, I'll let you start to kind of give your, your political 
political perspective on how you see some of this playing out? Yeah, I, I mean, I do, we know that we have champions in the legislature who are very, very interested in enhancing the, the base grant in, in the LCFF. I think you're all familiar with who our annual champions are on that. I do think that it's starting, the, the need is starting to crescendo um, out in the field and, and the, the, the voices of, of folks who have been asking for this um, for many, many years is, is beginning to crescendo. Uh, probably in light of the fact that we've got all of these other programs that, as Annette suggests, are competing uh, um, against our limited Proposition 98 uh, resources. Um, you know, probably from last year, the biggest ones being uh, the ELO uh, program, the community schools program, all of which have laudable um, uh, intention uh, in terms of how do we provide extended and wraparound services for all of our, our students and particularly our most vulnerable students. I would say this about UTK. I'm a little biased about this, I have to say. Just in full disclosure, I'm a little biased about this. Um, but for UTK, that's a little different for me. I don't, uh, um, as Megan had noted in her presentation, the governor makes good on his promise to rebench the Proposition 98 guarantee to pay for the additional TK students. So that doesn't erode the per pupil uh, uh, funding uh, that we provide um, in under Proposition 98 because he's paying for the additional students. However, just to be fair, uh, the additional $383 million uh, to pay for those lower classroom ratios in TK is within the guarantee. So that's um, an investment that does compete against our Prop 98 priorities. I think that this is going to be a fight this year, honestly. Um, I think that our lawmakers are hearing their constituents loud and clear about the need to invest in our most, some would argue, our most important uh, appropriation, that being the LCFF. Um, and I think that our lawmakers are really gearing up for that fight. But maybe my colleagues here um, and my pan and the panelists here would disagree with me. Megan, I'll give you a chance to comment on this. I know this is an issue we've been talking to our members about and thinking a lot about in terms of LCFF and base grants and whatnot. What, what would you say to that question? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to just um, keep making the case. I think in Sacramento, sometimes there's a tendency to focus on um, you know, the bigger picture numbers, the, the overall increases to um, Prop 98, rather than the fact that a lot of the dollars are locked up and don't um, help you pay salaries for teachers that you have and for pairs that you have and you need um, to, you know, you know, do the, the core operations. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that the advocacy team has begun having conversations on and, and will continue to do. Um, and we just need your help in telling your stories um, and, and painting those local pictures for your local electeds because they get lost in the big picture increases sometimes and um, sometimes you'll see them make comments. Um, they're confused how there's record amounts of education funding, but you all are considering laying off teachers. Um, yeah. Edgar, if I can add to, to, to the points that have been made. Um, I think the, the, the point that, that we've been trying to make across the street, and, and it's, it's resonated pretty well with a number of, of key stakeholders, is that given the significant uh, surplus that's available, there is an opportunity for them to, to remain committed to the programs that they initiated last year, the ones that, that, that were just described, um, while still uh, having significant dollars available to invest in the, in the LCFF. Um, so, so by no means is anyone talking about walking back uh, these commitments, and we know that, that they wouldn't go there. The legislature and governor have, 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 have made those points clear. But one of the biggest competing interests that we're seeing uh, uh, this year is, uh, is this significant augmentation to the expanded learning opportunities uh, program. Um, so it was slated to see a billion dollar increase from, from the prior year uh, budget. Um, but they're pro uh, proposing a, a $3.4 billion increase. And so we, and, and, and that's in the context of us already hearing from, from you all from the field about how difficult it is to scale up these programs um, immediately and that this is gonna take time. Uh, um, so it's, it's questionable uh, to, to say the least about, about why, um, why invest that amount of money um, in, in this current year. And again, if that money were freed up, the additional amount that was on top of the scheduled 
uh, increase, um, then again, that, that could significantly augment uh, the, the COLA that's provided to, to LCFF. Ivana, I appreciate your comments on that because that's something we've heard a lot uh, from our members in terms of while the merits of especially the expanded learning opportunity program is a, is, a, is a good example that right now, given what we're just facing with staffing shortages, it's just about finding the bodies to even ramp up some of these programs, right? And money alone isn't gonna alleviate some of those challenges. I know the proposal talks about partnering with uh, community-based organizations and others, they're facing some of the same challenges, right? In terms of staffing. So I think that's a good conversation piece, I think, uh, as we move through this process about no one questions uh, the merit of reinvesting in program commitments that have already made, but at what level and at the expense of potentially other programs. So uh, point well taken. Uh, Diana, I've got a question about universal meals uh, and if, the, if it, that applies to everyone, uh, you wanna clarify that? Sure, absolutely. So um, yes, it applies to all public schools. Beginning with 22, 23 school year, all public schools will be required to provide two uh, meals a day to, to all students. Um, to help with this cost though, um, all schools eligible for the community eligibility provision, which is the federal meals provision, will be required to apply high for the program by June 30th, 20. 22 if they're not already participating um, and then the state will cover the rest of the remaining un unreimbursed costs up to the federal um, free me per meal rate. Thanks Diana. I'm going to do a little time check here. I see we have about six minutes. I'm going to give our folks on our team and our guests a chance to give some final comments. I think we have time maybe for for one last question here. Uh, I see Daryl Camp, uh, Patty, I'll, I'll throw this universal TK question at, at you. Uh, I think there's just some of the concern being expressed about the expansion, the lower class size ratio, and some of the staffing considerations. Maybe you could just talk big picture of just how sensitive are the policymakers on this front? How do you see this conversation uh, playing out here uh, over this year and over this implementation period? Yeah, um, I, I, I really understand Daryl's um, concern, and I think that many of his colleagues would echo that concern, particularly in light of um, the pandemic and the, sh the shortages um, that the pandemic has um, thrust upon us in terms of our staffing shortages. And I'm, and I'm absolutely sensitive to that and empathetic uh, to that problem. I would, I'm going to venture and say that this was a tough, tough negotiation between the governor, the assembly, and the Senate last year. And, and, and Edgar, you have the privilege um, of a staff who was uh, right at the epicenter of that uh, conversation and those negotiations. It's difficult for me to imagine that given how delicate that negotiation was, that um, our state policymakers would walk back from that negotiation, um, not, notwithstanding these very, very real concerns that have emerged from, from the field. That's not to say that they wouldn't be open to maybe some surgical um, um, policy sort of proposals that would, that would offer some kind of relief while continuing to move the policy forward. The governor, you might remember when he ran for office, really ran on a child care um, platform. And one of the things that he touted was universal preschool. And he really looks at universal transitional kindergarten as California's way to achieve universal preschool for all four-year-olds. Um, and that has, notwithstanding LEA's impacts, but you know, when I think about larger, you know, the California residents, it has res uh, compounding benefits on California residents, like reducing childcare costs <laughs> and um, and things like that. Um, and so I, I, again, just the, the confluence of this delicate negotiation and, and, and the, the, the benefits that it would yield, I think I, I have a hard time believing that the legislature and the governor would walk back um, from that agreement, might be open to some surgical uh, relief proposals. Thanks, Patty, for that context. So we'll move into transition here to just some closing statements. I'll, I'll, I'll give first opportunity to Yvonne, just in terms of thinking, you know, seeing some of the questions, kind of seeing where do we go from here? What are things that, you know, you think folks need to be on the lookout here as we go through this budget development process here 
uh, in the coming months. Yvonne, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think I would just close with, with saying that this is the start of the, the, the process. And, and so for the next several months, we're gonna be engaging in, in conversations with, with all three stakeholders, the, the administration, the assembly and the Senate. Um, and so a, a lot to unravel and a lot to learn about what the governor is proposing. Um, but additionally and importantly, uh, uh, still a lot to come to see where the legislature is gonna be at and how they're gonna respond. And then the other variable, how revenue numbers are gonna shake out. And, 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 and as you point out the front end, that could change considerably between now and the end of the fiscal year. Um, just but one point I, I, I just wanna close with as well is that your voice matters in this process. Uh, and I certainly know that it's easy to question that and, and whether or not um, your voice does, um, but having worked uh, for legislators, um, it, it, I, I, I know firsthand that they care about what their constituents say. And now when we're in meetings with, with legislators and staff and administration, they are often talking about what they're hearing from their constituents in the field. Um, so keep them informed of just where you're at and just that and, and how the governor's proposal would impact you all um, and what would be most helpful to serving uh, your students and families because because again it, it, it's, it does make a difference. Thanks for, for that Yvonne and thank you for your advocacy on, on the continued advocacy on many of these issues. Uh, Patty, uh, closing comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that we're going to see the legislature come out in strong response um, to the governor's, how the governor is spending the Prop 98 dollars. I think they, they have a, um, they have their ideas of how they want to spend those Prop 98 dollars, including enhancing the LCFF through an adjustment uh, to the base grant. Additionally, uh, uh, we saw that the Senate and the Assembly in their budget blueprints already said that they want to see much more like a $10 billion uh, appropriation to fund school facilities, uh, not the $2.2 billion that the governor is proposing in his budget. So I think that's going to be a big one too, which can help districts with TK, <laughs> uh, with their TK facilities needs, um, and depending on how that's, that's crafted. So I think that, you know, the, the governor's budget proposal sets a, a, a nice foundation for what's going to be a healthy debate moving into May. Thank you, Patty, and thank you for, for joining us and sharing uh, so much of your wisdom with us. Uh, Megan, final thoughts, comments. You know, I think, um, I think Yvonne and Patty covered it well. Um, this is the beginning of the negotiation. So, you know, we'll be working with you all to um, fine tune what our asks are and what we need to be lobbying on. None of this is final and the legislature is gonna have some strong opinions. So um, we have a lot of opportunity to make big changes here. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for your work today on getting all this information out to our members. Uh, as uh, Christy noted in the chat, we will uh, we put the link there on our AXA website, on our resource hub. Within the next hour, you will see the slides. Uh, you will have the summary that we're finalizing. You'll hear a lot more from us, especially as some of the details uh, come out, as you've heard all the panelists talk about, that this is a iterative process where they, they, they it continues to change. They give us the trailer bill language. So this is just the beginning of, of, of the budget season here. And AXA will, will try to keep you abreast of all the changes and developments. Uh, quick plug for just our continual offerings. Uh, folks may know we have our legislative lunch break every week, uh, Wednesdays at one o'clock, budget and COVID related issues and everything else facing our schools are a continued uh, focal point on, on that programming. So please tune into that and just stay abreast on our AXA website, our social media channels uh, for other offerings and trying to help our members navigate these uh, challenging times. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Uh, we know it's not easy right now and please continue to communicate with us on, on ways that the organization can support you uh, during these times. Uh, so we will be in touch and, and thanks again.